Okay, recording is on. Welcome everybody to BC209, our course on holiness. And this is the first lecture uh, this week on this course on holiness. Let's please uh, pray together and we will get started. Um, I request somebody in the class to uh, pray with us and then we will start, please. Anybody can pray? Pastor, I'll pray. Please go ahead, Anita. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, Father God. Father, we want to give you glory and praises, O Lord Father, for this precious time, O Lord Father. Almighty, O Lord Father, open our ears and eyes, O Lord Father, Lord Jesus, spiritual. Father, Lord Jesus, to receive everything, O Lord Father, which has been taught to us, O Lord Father, that will be pleasing, sacrifice into your eyes, O Lord Father, Lord Father. Lord, you are the only source for us, O Lord Father, Lord Jesus, for our joy, for our Lord Father, life, and our Lord Father, good pleasures that are according to your word, that are, that are, let it be also, Lord Father, Lord Jesus, pleasing unto your eyes. Help us, O Lord Father, to yield everything, O Lord Father, that you please out of us, O Lord Father, Father God, as we learn, O Lord Father, Father Lord Jesus, enlighten our spiritual understanding, bless us with wisdom, O Lord Father God, to grasp everything that has been taught to us and to imply, O Lord Father God. Father, we need you more than ever before, Dad. Thank you that you are with us, O Lord. Father, I commit Pastor into your hand, O Lord Father. Father God, Jesus, I believe, O Lord Father, that you are speaking through him, O Lord Father, Lord Jesus. Thank you for his, O Lord Father, Lord Jesus, the faculty gift that he has, O Lord Father. Thank you for his heart, O Lord Father. We bless him, O Lord Father. Thank you, Lord Father. In the mighty and master's name of Jesus, we commit the time ahead into your hand. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Anita. All right. Good morning and welcome, everybody, to the class on holiness. Um, I'm going to quickly review what we did last week. And today we are getting into chapter four, which is, uh, yeah, let me say, um, addresses many of the practical questions that uh, uh, that that usually come up in relation to living in holiness. So uh, we will be getting into that today. I will go ahead and share the PDF that will help us to quickly review. Um, sorry, this is chapter four. Yes, we are in chapter four. We did chapter four last week. Um, uh, I'll just uh, quickly review this. So we talked about uh, the need, the call to perfect holiness in the flesh and in the spirit. That means to protect ourselves from things that, you know, the, the, the wrong, the dirt, the filth, the sin, that, that's all around us from uh, affecting us. And we have to perfect holiness, grow in holiness in the fear of God. And uh, so God works that in us and he empowers us. So he said, first of all, the Holy Spirit himself, he's a spirit of holiness. So he comes, he's doing his work in us. He's empowering us. He's strengthening us. He's helping us overcome. Uh, the filth around us that tries to, that would, you know, seek to attach itself um, to, to us. The Holy Spirit empowers us. Secondly, we are the Word of God. Just as we keep listening to the Word, it's cleansing us. You know, and this is so powerful, you know, example, uh, you know, uh, you, you may go sit in a church service. There could be hundreds, maybe even thousands of people around you, or you may be listening to a sermon online, whatever, you know, you're listening to the word. And if something in my life is not right, I'm listening to the word, the word comes. And then, you know, I feel like, oh, hey, I need to correct that. And then I pray, God, you know, uh, the, the light, you know, the, the word has come, it has shown its light. God, I know that 
this this particular thing, my life is not right. Please, uh, you know, take it out of me, cleanse me. So what has happened? Through the word, something in my life, which is not right, has been taken out. And holiness is being perfected in me, you know. So it's a very simple way, but it's a very powerful way. It happens, you know, just... Uh, uh, almost all the time, you know, when we listen to the word, it's affecting us. Something in us is being corrected, uh, changed, you know, and we are being uh, perfected in holiness through the word of God. Then, of course, we also spoke about how God disciplines us, lovingly corrects us by his word, by his spirit. He lovingly corrects us. Sometimes he uses people to speak into our lives and uh, he does it all for our profit, and right? He does. It's for our benefit that he works this way. He lovingly corrects us so that we could be partakers of his holiness, and we are trained by it. I mean, this is an ongoing thing, you know, uh, and uh, sometimes the same things keep repeating in our lives, but as God trains us, we get better at it, and we realize, okay, this is how we should respond quickly uh, when he corrects us, and uh, so Holiness is being perfected in us. Uh, so we covered those three things. And then we said number four is um, from our side. So God is working in us by his spirit, by his word, through his divine discipline. Then from our side, he in, he He requires consecration. Right? That is something he can't do. He, he wants us to do it. That means I say yes to his working. And so holiness has worked in our lives. He works in us, and but we must yield to it. That's our consecration. So he calls us to consecrate ourselves. And then he said, you know, consecration sometimes can be painful. Uh, like we saw in Matthew chapter 5, 29 and 30. Uh, you know, uh, it requires that you cut off something in our lives uh, so that we can, you know, present ourselves to God. You know, anything that's causing us to sin, that's, that's uh, causing us to go away in the wrong direction, we take it off so that we can present ourselves unto God. Right? So that's our response. And uh, this is where we stopped last week. Um, and we said that uh, a simple test, a simple test, you know, without making anything very complicated, just a simple test to ask myself, you know, or to check if I am actually walking in the highway of holiness is, am I walking in love, right? Because if we increase and abound in love, what will happen? We will be established blameless in holiness, right? So it's a simple thing. If I'm walking in love, then I know I'm walking in what is pleasing to God. I'm walking in God. And I will be, I know it will be the highway of holiness. It will be blameless in holiness. So it's a simple test for us to keep ourselves in holiness. Because when we walk in love, we are walking in God and God's in us. So we move forward from there. That's where we stopped last week. Now, godliness, godliness, uh, we, we need to understand is, is more than just the externals, right? Because God desires truth in the inward parts, right? Where does God desire truth? He desires that in the inward parts. That means in your inner person or like we are learning in the other course, in our spiritual person, our hidden person of the heart. God wants it there first. Because if it is there first, it becomes a permanent part of us. So whatever is established in your spirit is a permanent thing. Now, of course, it, you know, if, if it's a negative thing, of course, you can get it out. But if it's a good thing, it can be put in you and it can endure. 
So God desires truth where? In the inner person, not just the outer person. Because the outside, if I just, you know, the outside could be a pretense. You know, uh, I could pretend to do this or pretend to do that. But when it is established in my heart, then it becomes part of me. Right? So God desires truth in the inward parts. Right? So again, even in Romans 4, that, Psalm, that was Psalm 51 and verse 6. And then in Romans 14, 17, you know, Paul says, look, God's kingdom is not about eating and drinking. The emphasis or the focus is not on these matters, but it's on righteousness, peace, and joy that comes from the Holy Spirit. So Romans 14, 17, he says, look, God's kingdom, the emphasis is on what comes from the Holy Spirit. Righteous, righteousness, peace, and joy. So it's not the outward eating and drinking, but focus on righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So we also must, our focus, when we're talking about holiness or godliness, being like God, our focus must be, let it start from the inside. Of course, if it starts on the inside, it will show up on the outside. Uh, you know, we will glorify God in the food and drink, of course. But it's got to start from the inside. It's got to be that righteousness, the peace and the joy that comes from the Holy Spirit, starting in our inner person and then expressing itself on the outside. And um, these, these are scriptures we kind of are working on in our other course in when we talk about the hidden person of the heart, uh, the uh, and in First Timothy chapter two, verse nine and ten, First Peter three, three to five, in both these passages, the emphasis is on what comes from the inside. Right? It says, don't focus on you know the outside, the apparel, the clothing, all of that, but it's the godliness uh, which comes from the inside, or it is this incorruptible beauty that comes from the hidden person. Right? And uh, so, you know, uh, what I want to say is that, okay, I, I know these verses are speaking to women and having to do with, um, yeah, the, you know, what you wear and so on. But I think uh, what I want to say here is, is for all of us, whether men or women, that our focus should be on the godliness, the, the, the beauty that's formed in the inner person. And then let that show up in who we are as people, right? So whether we are men or women, okay. I, I know I'm going a little out of the context of these verses, but uh, nevertheless, we are emphasizing the right thing, which is godliness is something that starts in the heart and then comes outside, uh, expressed in the way we live. So when we talk about holiness and godliness, let's not get too focused or let's not start with the outside. Let's start with the inside, the heart. And from there, let these things come forth in our lives. Okay. So having said the, this, um, I want to, in our next chapter, we want to talk about the motivation for holiness. Now, before we get into, you know, overcoming temptation and all those kinds of things later on, it's good to have why is holiness important in the life of the believer. So this chapter is on why personal holiness. And this chapter is also arranged in terms of question answers. Now, what has happened in the church? Um, I think more so in the last decade or, yeah, the last decade or a little over a decade now, is that somehow uh, the, the, the ideas and the, the teaching that, was, that has been put forth, especially on grace and on the goodness of God, both of these are beautiful things, right? The grace of God, the goodness of God, beautiful. But 
somehow we have presented grace and we have presented the goodness of God in such a way that we have totally, it's almost like we've said, don't worry about holiness. It's almost like, right? So that at the end of the day, people even ask, why should I be holy? If God is so gracious and God is so good, why is holiness important? It's, it's left us thinking like that. And so I've uh, intentionally put this in, a, in, in, in these kind of questions because uh, these are common questions that people have asked. So this chapter on why personal holiness has been, uh, you know, we have the main headings, but we're also kind of answering some underlying questions uh, that, uh, that have, you know, come up in the minds of people and I say believers, uh, which we will address. But if you and I understand then why personal holiness is important, then we'll be able to, you know, we won't question why we need to live a holy life. And we will take things seriously. If we are not, you know, really convinced that holiness is important, one thing is sure, we will live compromised lives. The reason many believers are living compromised lives is because they're not convinced that holiness is that important. Because we have learned the grace of God, we have learned the goodness of God. And it's left us feeling that hmm, holiness is not that important, so I can compromise. But we need to reverse that. And we need to be convinced of the importance of personal holiness to the point compromise is not an option. And when we are so convinced about the importance of personal holiness, we will live with reverence and godly fear while we enjoy the grace and goodness of God. So understand that godliness is not robbing us of the enjoyment of the grace and the goodness of God. Instead, godliness makes the enjoyment of grace and goodness that much better. And so we need to bring that back into our teaching on grace and goodness, that godliness is important in while we know about the grace and goodness of God. So we will answer some of these questions, okay? So personal holiness, the difference it makes. So, you know, our question here is, if a believer has already been saved and his sins are forgiven, meaning, you know, Jesus already paid for all our sins, past, present, future. So when Jesus died on the cross 2000 years ago, he paid, already paid for all the sins we, have, we may commit, you know, 10 years from now, should the Lord tarry, it's already been paid, then why should a believer live a holy life? You know, that's like an unspoken thought in the minds of people. Now I'm talking about believers. Right? So why? Well, there are some things we must understand here which we cannot disregard. That sin affects our relationship with God. Well, our position in Christ doesn't change. Right? And these are two different things. So what do you mean? See, you are in Christ as a believer. You are in Christ. That never changes. It's not like you go in and out of Christ. You are in Christ, yes. But being in Christ, your relationship is your day-to-day -day engagement with God, your communion with God. You can be in Christ because God put you in Christ, but you can have a weak relationship with God because perhaps a believer's living in sin. And these are two different things. Our position in Christ is a work of God's grace. Our relationship with God is a day-to-day -day communion with God based on our walk with God. So how can you prove it? Well, it's right there. 
in first john and you know several places we just refer in first john paul is talking about fellowship now you remember first john is written by john the apostle he was a beloved disciple of christ he wrote the gospel of john he talked about us being in christ you know christ is the wine and we are branches and all of that so he understands this thing about you know being connected to jesus and yet in first john he's saying look we are we have fellowship with him but if we walk in darkness believers if we walk in darkness we are lying but for us to have fellowship we must walk in the light as he is in the light and he's writing to believers look we have to walk in the light as he is in the light if you're going to walk in fellowship with him that's relationship but if we claim that we have fellowship with him but we're walking in darkness that means i'm a believer is living in sin the believer is just lying Now, in the gospel, in the epistle of John, he explains. He says, "Look, if you, if a believer is walking in hatred, he's walking in darkness." So he's not even talking about you know externals, like or oh, a believer is doing something wrong. He said, "Look, if a believer has hatred towards his brother, that's walking in darkness." So he explains that to us. If a believer is practicing unrighteousness, he's walking in darkness. and then this fellowship we cannot have fellowship that's relationship you're still in christ but this is being affected but the good news is if we walk in the light as he is in the light what he's saying is even if we sin the blood of jesus christ cleanses us from all sin so why would he say this it's possible for a believer as he's walking in the light to do something that's out of light but then there is the cleansing power of the blood of Jesus and then we know verse 8 that avail that when we confess our sins okay so why should a believer live a holy life well one reason is because a sin affects a relationship a fellowship with god it doesn't change a position but affects a relationship right and uh, you know so when a person when a believer sins our heart condemns us saying hey you've done something wrong and if a heart condemns us this is first john 3 21 and 22 if heart condemns us then our confidence towards god is affected my position is still there i'm still in christ but my confidence my sense of going before god and you know engaging him with him is affected now think about this if a believer is living in sin well, that's walking in darkness but pretends to have fellowship with god that is he pretends to be confident toward god how could it be what he's doing is he's ignoring his own heart this is where this is the voice this is the conscience this is you know his heart speaking but he's ignoring it and he's lying to himself that everything is okay so he puts on the pretense of having confidence toward god when actually he's walking in darkness So what am I saying? That we have to listen to our heart. But if I choose not to listen to my heart, then I'm going to be lying to myself. So why should a believer walk, live a holy life, relationship with God? Second reason: Why should a believer live a holy life? Because sin gives the enemy access. Now again, Paul is writing in Ephesians four. to believers he says be angry do not sin you are into believers do not let the sun go down on your anger 
and nor give any place to the devil. The implication here is, or the inference here is, if I am in sin, I'm going to let this continue in my life, I could potentially give place to the devil. Otherwise, there's no need for this instruction to the believer, don't give place to the devil. Now, I'm not saying the moment you do something wrong, the devil comes running in. No. But if we continue practicing sin, that is, we don't deal with that sin. We don't bring it cleansed and forsaken. But a believer continues in sin. I'm going to give place to the devil. It gives the enemy access. James is also writing to believers. He says, submit to God. And we will see this again a little later. So submit to God, resist the devil. He'll flee from you. Then he continues writing to believers. And, he's, and these are very strong words. Draw near to God. He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. That means if those of you writing to believers, saying, believers, those of you who are continuing in sin, get your hands clean. Get it out of the dirt. Get out of the dirt. So it's a strong word. But it's given in the context right here, you know. You've got to resist the devil. He'll flee from you. He'll draw near to God. He'll draw near to you. But you can't draw near to God. You can't resist the devil if you're not cleansing your hands. And... If you're double-minded, if you're double-minded, purify your heart. That means become single-minded or be, become fully persuaded. Become committed in your heart. Don't be divided in your heart. You know, little to God, little to the world, which is the context. We read the verses earlier uh, in James 4, in the preceding verses, he says, you know, you're a friend of God, you're a friend of the world. So they're double-minded, you know, little here, little there. So he says, you've got to purify your heart. Right? So, taken in context, submission to God, drawing near to God, resisting the devil, requires that a believer keep his hands clean and his heart pure. If my hands are not clean, if my heart is not pure, then these things will, I, I won't be able to do these things. Submitting to God, resisting the devil, drawing near to God. And lastly, you know, we must understand that sin will cripple our effectiveness in ministry. Because if, I, if a believer is living in sin, hey, people are not going to listen. I said, so what kind of a person is this? Uh, he's not living what he's, you know, he's, he's preaching. What kind of a testimony? It'll cripple our effectiveness. Uh, it will also impact the exercise of gifts and spiritual authority. Uh, the maybe for some time, you know, especially uh, if, if somebody is living in sin and they cover it up, you know, okay, yeah. People won't know and people won't see for some time, but at some point, it, these things will happen. You know, these things will happen. People will get to know the our life, then they will discredit everything we've said. Uh, they will disregard. It's difficult for people to receive, and uh, they will not accept our gifts and authority. You know, they will say, "Okay." He's living something, he's speaking something else. So, you know, this will get affected. So, just three quick reasons, you know. Okay, why is holiness important? Even though my sins are forgiven. Well, one, Christ has truly paid for all my sins, but my relationship with God, my day-to-day -day relationship with God. Secondly, remember, sin can open a door to the enemy. And thirdly, 
can affect our ministry. Then righteousness and holiness, if you talk about that, you know, it is true that we are righteous in Christ. You know, so the question is, in the minds of many believers, okay, we are already righteous in Christ. Christ is my righteousness. I cannot be made any more acceptable to God. Christ is my righteousness. So that means God has given me his own righteousness. So why should I live holy? Why do I need to live holy if I'm already righteous in Christ? Right? If we are already righteous of God, why live a holy life? And, uh, you know, the Bible is saying we've already been given this inheritance. God has already given it to us. We've already been sanctified and perfected forever in Christ. So if all of this is done, why live a holy life? So, so, so this is trying to reconcile our identity in Christ, our righteousness in Christ, with the living of a holy life. Now, the problem here, or the, 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 how where this, 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 this problem comes from is, we are taught that, look, in Christ you're righteous, in Christ you've been justified, in Christ you have an inheritance, in Christ you're sanctified, you're perfected, it's already done in Christ, so nothing to worry, okay? So if that's already done, why do I need to bother being holy? Life? Why do I bother living a holy life? So that's another thought, that question we have to answer, right? So it's related to what we have already spoken in the previous uh, question on living a holy life, but let's add to that. You must understand that Righteousness is a, a standing before God, but righteousness is also a way of life before God. It's contained in that one word, righteousness. It's a right standing, but it's also a right living. It's a right standing before God, that means I'm accepted in God's eyes. It's also a right living, that means I live in a way that is acceptable and approved by God. And it's both, both these aspects are part of New Testament, right? Of biblical righteousness, both Old and New Testament, right? So when Paul, for instance, is talking about the new man, which is created in true righteousness, holiness. So there, this new man is already in this state it is in a state of true righteousness and holiness. But yet, while teaching about the new man, which is in the creature, in the image of God and true righteousness and holiness, he's still telling people, you got to put off, put off, get rid of your former conduct. That means, uh, you can't continue living the sinful life you used to live because the inner man is true righteousness, is righteousness and true holiness. So he didn't say, hey, your new man is righteousness and holiness, so live however you want. He didn't say that. He said, the new man, is true righteousness and holiness, but you got to get rid of your old way of living the old way. And that, of course, is possible when you let the new man affect your mind and your body. Right? That, that's why we have to renew our mind so that this new man can begin to express itself uh, into, uh, through our mind into our body. So, if only our position of righteousness was important and not our living of righteousness, he would not have given this instruction. 
He would have said, hey, it's okay. Your new man is in, inside is righteous and only live however you want. Doesn't matter. He could have said that, but he didn't say that. He said, your new man is righteous and holy. That is, you have a right standing with God, but you've got to live right before God. So like, watch out for your conduct. Right? So righteousness has both these aspects. And uh, uh, in our teaching, we intentionally emphasize righteousness as a standing before God, which is important because uh, we are dealing with the guilt, shame, and condemnation, which is another big problem among believers. But in our teaching of righteousness and in our attempt to deal with the guilt, shame, and condemnation, to get rid of that, we must not forget that we must say that, look, we still need to live right. And both are part of New Testament righteousness. Developing this further, why personal holiness? Why is this important? A third question is, you know, what difference will it make if I live a holy life in my practical experience? Because anyway, God is giving everything to me freely by grace. I'm not earning anything. Okay, so here's another question. And it has to do with the rewards of personal holiness. Anything I'm going to receive from God, I'm receiving by grace. And God has already blessed me with every spiritual blessing I had to receive by faith. So if that's the case, well, what was the reward of uh, living a holy life? You know, practically, what difference is this going to make in the blessings I enjoy? Because everything is by grace through faith. Where does holiness come in? Okay. How do we respond to that? Well, it's related again. All of these are related. Holiness is key to our experience of him. We, we used the word fellowship or relationship earlier in the first point. But now we can say, look, your experience of God is going to be affected. So we're not talking about, okay, yeah, we, I mean, we know that God has blessed us everything by grace and he tells us to, he tells us to receive it by faith. That is all true. But your experience of God is determined by your life of holiness. So how do you, what do you mean? Well, if you look at in John 13, when Jesus was washing the feet of his disciples, you know, Peter raises an objection. Lord, uh, you can never wash my feet. I mean, I mean, he's just, you know, he's just being, uh, I would say, you know, very considerate or, you know, he's just expressing his heart, Lord, 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 no, you can't wash my feet. But Jesus' answer is very profound. He said, and you and I need to understand it, not in just the context of washing feet. Listen what Jesus said. If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. If I do not wash you, is he talking about, okay, just getting the dirt off your feet? Or is he talking about something more? If I don't wash you, you have no part with me. Right? 
Now, what is Jesus trying to tell us here? It's not the washing of the feet. Because physically, they're just still dirty, right? I mean, they walked around everywhere. They must have been sweaty and dirty. So just washing a little bit of the feet is not going to make them physically clean. But the statement Jesus is making, like, you know, if you look, listen to you know, many of the statements of Jesus in John 3, he said, the wind blows where it wants and you don't understand where it's coming from going. So as everyone is born of the spirit. I mean, he's, he's, he's talking about spiritual truth in that statement. So we must understand, look for the spiritual truth in this statement. If I do not wash you, if I don't clean you, if I don't sanctify, purify, you have no part with me. There's, there's this fellowship with me that experience of me cannot happen. If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Was Peter an apostle? Of course. Was he already chosen to be an apostle? Of course. Would he remain as an apostle? Of course. So there's something more than your position. It's your experience that he's talking about, of who he is. That comes through the him washing us. We can then part with him. We can partake of him, experience him much more. A few more thoughts here. I know it's already 11 time up. A few more thoughts here. So we're we are answering this question. You know, why is holiness important if everything is coming by grace and through faith and everything's already been given? Why is it? Well, for you to partake of him or to be a part of him. Secondly, I'll just try to go through this very quick. Uh, possessing our possessions. Obadiah 1 7 talks about on Mount Zion, there will be deliverance and there will be holiness. The house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. Now, Mount Zion in the Old Testament parallels the church in the New Testament. Mount Zion, basically uh, Jerusalem or the people of God. He says there, among the people of God, there's going to be deliverance. So I'm transposing it to New Testament. And there will be holiness. And the people of God, house of Jacob, referring to the people of God, will possess their possessions. That means for us to walk in our inheritance, we must experience both deliverance and holiness. On Mount Zion, if I transpose it to the New Testament, it's the church, there will be deliverance, but there'll also be holiness. And the house of Jacob, meaning God's people, will possess their possessions. So if there is no working of God's deliverance, and if there's no working of God's holiness, God's people are not going to be able to possess their possessions. I'll just do one more, and then uh, we will keep the last 10 minutes for questions. Uh, I think there are two more here, or three more here. Oh, God. All right. Uh, let's do one more and take questions. Uh, why is holiness important if everything is given to us freely by grace and we're already being blessed with every spiritual blessing? Well, to believers, the Apostle Paul wrote, godliness is profitable in all things. That means it is true we are saved by grace through faith. 
it is true god has blessed us with every spiritual blessing by grace through faith and we can receive and enjoy but there is certain things that come through godliness godliness is profitable for all things in this life and in the life to come that means there are certain things that i cannot have in this life outside of godliness i am a believer god has given to me everything freely by grace through faith but godliness brings something into my life in this life and in the life to come which i need to have so godliness is profitable and this definitely has to do with the development of our spiritual life because the he, he contrasts right bodily exercise godliness the bless the benefit that bodily exercise brings to the human body godliness brings to your human spirit and that benefit is not received by grace through faith but that benefit is received the same way the benefits of bodily exercise come to the human body physical body godliness brings those benefits to the human spirit okay i uh, we are already out of time i'm going to pause here we will continue this on wednesday but let's take some time for questions okay i'm looking in the chat okay so anita's question is god made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of god so uh, that's second corinthians 5:21 so what paul is teaching us there in second corinthians 5:21 is our standing before god has been taken care of right so we have become the righteousness of god we are perfectly completely accepted by god we are righteous that's what gives us standing before god we can go before god freely without any sense of condemnation and we can therefore have fellowship with god but what we are trying to say is also we have to live righteous okay so second corinthians 5:21 deals with the issue of sin sin has been removed we've been justified made righteous before god um christopher please explain first john 321 how do we have confidence towards god when our heart does not condemn us yeah so you know uh, practically it's like this right if 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 my heart is not condemning me i can go before god uh, but if my heart is con condemning me or like in hebrews 10 it says you know uh, 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 i have a bad conscience because my heart is condemning me i need to cleanse myself of a bad conscience right so example suppose you know i am um, i treated somebody very badly i'm going to go before god in prayer i'm going to worship god then inside me saying hey first of all you treated someone badly you haven't sorted that out how can you worship god what's happening my conscience is condemning me or i have a bad conscience because my conscience is telling me i can't go and worship god if i have treated somebody badly so what must i do i say god i'm sorry i you know i i did this i treated this person badly i'm sorry about it and i apologize to that person you know so i may call that person i may message that person whatever i can do i apologize i say hey what i did was wrong i'm sorry so what has happened now my conscience is clear off of that that so 
now I can have confidence toward God. This is a practical thing, right? But if there's nothing like that, my heart is clear, my conscience is clear, I can easily, I just go in and worship God. I move in the righteousness God has, God has given me, I just worship God, okay? Uh, um, Mangi, can you please explain Matthew chapter 7, verse 23. Let's look at it. Uh, Matthew chapter 7 and verse 23. Verse 23. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Right. So Jesus is talking here about um, um, uh, uh, those who are doing things, uh, but they, you know, they prophesy and they're doing these super, supernatural things. They're doing prophesying, casting demons out, wonders in His name, but it's not coming out of a place of relationship with the Lord. Right. So Jesus is saying, "I never knew you," so there's no relationship. Secondly, uh, they're not doing the will of the Father. So two things, if you look at the whole context, verse 21 to 23, uh, there are two main problems. One, there is no relationship with God. Two, there is no doing the will of God. So what are they doing? They're just using the name of Jesus in order to do certain things. Now, the question, of course, would be, how is it possible that they're doing supernatural things in the name, but without relationship and without alignment to the will of God. Uh, now, there could be many possibilities. I'm not saying it is always the same. Or one is they could be using the name, but they could be demonically empowered. So how can, is that, how can that be possible? Because uh, Satan's counterfeit is like that, right? Uh, they can come as close to the real Jesus, but it's not the real Jesus. Uh, they may even use the name of Jesus. And you know, if you look at New Age, uh, people who are operating in New Age, it's very much like that. They use the name of Jesus. They may quote the Bible, but it's not from the Lord. It's from a different spirit, right? So, uh, and that's what counterfeit is always about. Counterfeit is like come as close to the real, but it's not the real, right? So that's one way or two. Maybe these are people who are kind of just departing from the faith. You know, they're just walking away and they are just using the name for their own gain. That's a possibility. But the key problem here in West, this passage is, one is, I never knew you. That means they didn't have a relationship with Jesus. Two, they're not doing the will of the Father. Those are the two problems in Matthew 7, 21 to 23. Okay. Um, I hope I explained uh, Prabhakar's question. Next one, Prabhakar's question. Uh, please give us a few scripture for sin cripples our effectiveness in ministry please. Uh, a few scriptures for sin that cripples our effectiveness. Okay, let me just think very quickly. Uh, one, I would think of a man called Demas, uh, who was a fellow worker with Jesus, uh, with uh, Paul. And then in 2 Timothy chapter 4, so um, if you look at this in 2 Timothy um, chapter 4, um, yeah, I'm trying to find that verse, yeah. Uh, verse 10, 2 Timothy 4.10, Paul writes about Demas. Now in, I think it's in Philippians or Philemon, Paul refers to Demas as his co-worker. But then in his very last episode, in 2 Timothy 4.10, Paul says, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. So here's the example of one man who was a fellow worker with Paul, who traveled with Paul in the ministry. But then now he's left everything. Why? Because he loved this world. So there must have been something uh, that attracted him. Uh, we don't know what it is, uh, but he has... That's it. His ministry is ended. He's no longer serving with Paul. He's gone away to pursue whatever. So Paul writes about him in 2 Timothy 4.10. Um, let me think of other examples of 
scriptural example, sin tripling effectiveness in ministry. Mm. What I can think of is in First Timothy chapter three. The other another example I can think of right now is um, uh, Paul in First Timothy chapter three, as he outlines the qualifications of somebody who's going to be a spiritual leader. He says in verse six, a spiritual leader should not be a novice. He shouldn't be a new person. Why? Because being puffed up with pride, he ends up into the same condemnation of the devil. So think about this. Uh, here's a person who wants to be a spiritual leader. But Paul says, don't put a new person there. Why? Because he gets proud. And if he gets proud, gets pr full of pride, what happens? He will be he will fall in the same condemnation as the devil. What happened to the devil? Pride got him out of the presence of God. And he's saying this same thing could happen if you make a new believer as a spiritual leader, pride will get him out of the ministry. So um, that's the second example I can just think of right now. Uh, this is 1 Timothy 3, uh, 6 and 7. Okay. Uh, there could be others, but I'm not. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, Christopher, please explain your last point. Godliness does not come out of grace. Um, oh, no, what I was contrasting, I wasn't saying godliness doesn't come out of grace. What, I, what I'm saying, I'm contrasting two things. There are things that are freely given to us by grace, and there are things that come out of godliness. So godliness, of course, is empowered by grace, meaning uh, godliness in our lives is a work of God's grace in us by his word, by his spirit, and by his divine discipline. But so, but there are, there are God has given to us things freely by his grace. But there are things that Godness brings to us, which we don't, doesn't come to us as part of this things that God has given, the blessings God has given to us freely by grace. And the way we saw it in First Timothy 4 is, Paul is saying, the way bodily exercise benefits the physical body, godliness benefits the spiritual person. So that means the development of the spiritual person, it is a work of grace, but it comes through godliness being perfected in us. So it's not like God just blesses that into our spirit as a spiritual blessing, but it comes into our spirit through godliness being worked in us the same way bodily exercise, somebody goes through bodily exercise in order to develop their physical body. So that's the contrast that I was making there. All right, uh, Divya, in Abadaya 117, I did not understand regarding the possessions that is referring for, to for a New Testament believer are the spiritual blessings, the possessions. So in that case, how can we say that it's purely by grace? Yeah. So it's talking about, yeah. So the answer is, uh, yes, it's talking to us about the inheritance, right? Possessing our possessions. So that means God has already blessed us in the spirit, right? It's already ours, but we need to possess them or walk in them in the natural, right? In our everyday life. So that's what we talk about as coming into our inheritance or possessing our inheritance, right? So God has given it to us, but we need to walk in it. We need to experience it. It's got to become experiential in our life. But in order to do that, what we're seeing in Abadaya 117 is that just as there has to be deliverance and holiness on Mount Zion so that the house of Jacob can possess the possessions, if you parallel that to the New Testament, God's people have to walk in deliverance and holiness in order to walk in their spiritual inheritance. So what we are saying is that holiness is, is, a, is one of the keys there for us to walk in our inheritance, to experience it spiritually. Positionally, every believer has been blessed with every spiritual blessing. God did it by grace. Practically, holiness is one of those keys there is what we were trying to say, okay? All right, so already 12 o'clock. Uh, let's answer the questions of people who raised their hands. Say your question, please. Yes, Pastor, very quickly. I'll just ask, uh, pertaining Matthew 7, 21 to 23, I just wanted to verify if um, the scripture also applies to Christians who have fallen away but are just doing working in the manifestation gifts but don't truly 
are not truly really practicing righteousness. They are not walking in holiness, and they are just doing it for uh, their own good. Does that verse apply to them, or does it just apply to only those who never really had a relationship and are using other sorts of um, powers, you know, to prophesy, to cast out demons? Or mm. does this apply to both parties? Those who are Christians at one point, but gave into the lust of the world, and by virtue of the gifts they have, they're just doing it for their own sake, for their own will, or for their own um, glory, if I mm. put it that way. Yeah, so. Yeah. so, to answer your question, both those states, the answer, uh, I mean, it is, uh, those, both those conditions are possible and it's true. That means uh, it is possible that those who once knew about the things of God, they have departed from that place of, you know, relationship with God, but are just using it. Uh, and then you find this really brought out for us uh, in, 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 uh, in the epistle of Jude, and also in Second Peter, uh, you know, so both Second Peter and Jude talk about these kind of people. That means they started out right, but now they've gone away and they're now pursuing things for their own gain, right? So that is possible. When we go over to Matthew 7, 21 to 23, if you go on to my answer, my understanding is both these are possible that yes, but if you want to get very technical, somebody can say, well, he, Jesus said, I never knew you. That means they didn't even, he didn't even knew, know the Lord at any point in time. So if you want to get very technical, somebody could say that. And I said, okay, fine, we won't fight about it because, okay, these are people who never had a relationship with God and they just are using the name of the Lord and fine. But we also know the other condition is also possible because we see it mentioned in other places in scripture. Uh, especially Second Peter and Jude, talk about these kinds of people. So even if somebody says Matthew 7 does not talk about people who are, uh, only talks about people who never knew the Lord well, okay, very technical, yes, we'll agree with that. But it's also uh, um, uh, possible that people who once knew the Lord depart and then just use the name of the Lord for their own gain. We see it in other places. Did I answer Thank your question? You. Okay. Yes, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Anita's question, last one. Pastor, will it be possible to name the recordings after the portion covered in that? It would be helpful. Oh, you're talking about the videos. Put the names, yeah. See, the problem, Anita, is uh, that is being done by our TA, and the TA doesn't know, like the TA is not attending the class. Uh, these are recordings automatically recorded by Google Classroom. So Google automatically gives it a number. Um, and then we just follow a standard nomenclature for all our recordings. And it's done by a TA who doesn't necessarily know the content of the recording. And so that's why, uh, and it will not be practical for the TA to listen because there are nine, you know, at least nine videos every day. Uh, yeah, so it's going to be a little difficult. Uh, so that's why we have, we just follow a standard nomenclature using the date and the course number for the recordings. Uh, yeah, so I'm not, uh, you know, it'll be a little too much work to get it, get that done. But um, thanks for the suggestion, okay. Uh, is it possible to work in gifts without relationship with God? Uh, so, like we said, uh, so that's the last question, Prabhaka. So, like we said, Prabhaka, uh, you know, and we and you read about this in Second Second Thessalonians chapter two, uh, uh, verses you know one to eleven. That whole passage uh, where we talk about, I mean, where Paul writes about lying signs and wonders. So there are signs and wonders, but these are lying signs and wonders. Now, when you talk about lying signs and wonders, you're talking about deceptive signs and wonders. The implicit idea there is, it's gonna be as close to the real. Okay. 
And there are two categories of people who could flow in that. One is those who once knew how to flow in it through a genuine relationship with God, but now they've gotten out of that place of genuine relationship, but they're operating, they're moving in that because they know the form and the function, but either they're just moving it as, a, as, as, a, as an expression of the flesh, which is like they're just making things happen, but there may not be real fruit, or they could be empowered by the wrong source. So that's one category. And second is, the, the second category is, these are people who are starting out right from influence of demonic spirits, the wrong spirits. But the output is lying signs and wonders, meaning these are very close to the real. They look like the real. Okay, so both possibilities are there. So these people don't have a relationship with the true God, but they are, you know, the, the manifestations look like as though they are from God. And if you look at the church world, uh, these things have happened, uh, or I should say they continue to happen. And that's where we need to have discerning, discern discernment or the discerning of spirits as well. Okay. Thank you, Pastor. Okay. Um, can we, all right, I know we rushed through the last bit. Uh, uh, so the focus here today is you know, on, on why holiness, why personal holiness is important. We're kind of answering certain thoughts and questions. I uh, will finish this on Wednesday. Okay, let's close in prayer and then we'll dismiss. I know we've already taken 10 minutes over. Could somebody pray and dismiss us, please? Can I pray, Pastor? Please go ahead. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, for this wonderful opportunity, Lord, you've given us, Lord, to learn these uh, spiritual truths. Father, we pray that let these sink in, Lord, that they may renew our minds, Father. They may transform our lives, Father. They may transform our communities, Father. Lord, we pray that, uh, uh, thank you, Lord, that you are teaching us, Lord, why uh, we uh, need to have holiness, Lord, in our lives so that uh, your character, your nature will be reproduced in us, Father. It will be reflected in us and through us, Father, Lord. We pray to bless uh, uh, Pastor Ashish, Father Lord, uh, em uh, empower him, Lord, equip him with the Holy Spirit and continue to use him mightily, Lord. I pray, Lord, for each and every one of us, Lord. We pray, Lord, these sessions, Lord, uh, may bear fruit in our lives, Father. Let us not just hear it and be like, uh, uh, Father, in the parable of the sower. Uh, it just, it it be taken away, Lord. We pray that let it bear fruit in us, Lord. Take deep root in our hearts, Father, Lord, and spirits, Lord. And uh, all these things we commit uh, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. Um... Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Enjoy the rest of your day. I'll see you all tomorrow. God bless. Bye now.